The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And good morning, everybody. This is Ray Hanania here at the Ray Hanania Radio Show on Wednesday, June 23, 2021. It's 8 a.m. Eastern Time, and uh, we got a nice, interesting program for you. Newsmaking. In segment one, we're going to be talking with Congressman Mark Pocon who is a, a Democrat from Wisconsin's 2nd Congressional District. He was elected in 2013 uh, after serving 14 years in the Wisconsin State Assembly. He had been a big, like many congressmen, you get into the uh, legislature there at the highest level, uh, and you become very pro-Israel because that's all you hear. Um, but he was able to uh, take a trip uh, to the Middle East and uh, got to see things from a different perspective uh, after uh, going on a trip, I believe, sponsored by J Street, the uh, liberal progressive Jewish lobby here in the United States. His whole attitude changed. We're going to talk to him about that and also about his proposal urging President Biden. They announced this week that, uh, you know, we're shutting down everything in Afghanistan now 20 years uh, later after September 11th which will uh, be this uh, coming September. And uh, that means that there's $50 billion in money that was assigned to that war, that endless war that we're finally going to bring to an end. And uh, Congressman Pocan led a group of 50 members uh, pushing for the spending of that money for other issues, uh, health care, jobs, uh, you know, uh, climate security and housing. We're going to talk with him about that. In segment two, we're going to be speaking with Jonathan Gornow on the newly launched Arab News GERD Deep Dive, a look at the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, and there's news on that today from uh, Sudan wanting to look at this extension of the uh, Egyptian Blue Nile into uh, Ethiopia through Sudan. It's got, it's kind of interesting. They Phenomenal interactive uh, uh, setup that they have at ArabNews.com if you want to check it out. The Battle for the Nile. It's very cool. Um, we're going to take a quick break here, and uh, we will have Congressman Polk on, who's going to be calling in. He's not going to be Zooming in. I know that we got a lot of people on Facebook who watch, but you'll be able to hear the Congressman uh, there and also on our radio stations at WNZK AM 690 in Greater Detroit and WDMV AM 700 in Greater Washington, D.C. I'm really looking forward to talking to Congressman Mark Pocan. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the Congressman right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development, cooperation with other experts worldwide, and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can. Keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination. Freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Ziad Brand. 
quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji, and at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you, and I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F, or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. The only big Arab American radio station in the country, honestly, the U.S. Arab Radio Network. We're sponsored by Arab News at ArabNews.com, which brings you the news every morning uh, in Paris and London and Tokyo and uh, Islamabad and Dubai and Riyadh. And, of course, we're opening as a U.S. Special Correspondent bureaus in Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C. Joining me this morning is Congressman Mark Pocan, who represents Wisconsin's 2nd Congressional District, elected in 2013, following 14 years in the Wisconsin State Assembly. Congressman, welcome to the program this morning. It's such an honor to have you on. Glad to be here. Some stories in the media, and I, but I wanted to hear it from you. What happened? The, you had been traveling as a guest, obviously, of uh, the government of Israel to Israel, and they do that with every member of Congress. Smart move on their part. Um, and uh, you got to see one side of the conflict, but I understand that it was uh, while on a trip hosted or sponsored by J Street, the progressive uh, lobby uh, for Middle East peace here in the U.S., um, that you got to see a different perspective, and it impacted how you view the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What happened? Yeah, so first, it wasn't a J Street trip, although J Street, I think, does um, excellent trips to the region. It was actually uh, one of the, the worst-named uh, non-government organizations we have called the, the Humpty Dumpty Institute. Uh, we often just call it HDI. But they go into a lot of areas that, um, you know, traditionally members of Congress and the public eye doesn't go to. And uh, they did the first ever trip to Palestine. And I was a part of a, a delegation to there. And, you know, seeing, um, I, I think, a broader perspective of the same very small region, uh, you know, really made me realize that if you're ever going to have peace uh, in the region, you have to treat everyone uh, with respect and dignity, and you have to have some fairness and rules, and you have to uh, have a different attitude than I think we currently have in the region, um, or else you're never going to get to that uh, achieved peaceful solution. Yeah, and, and this is, just to be clear to everybody, this isn't that you're suddenly anti-Israeli, you're supportive of Israel, but now you have a better understanding of the Palestinian issue, and I think that makes you more supportive of achieving peace, correct? Uh, exactly. You know, um, I, I think uh, what we need to do as a country is get back to a position, and certainly the last four years weren't we weren't in that position, of being able to bring sides together and try to negotiate peace. You know, every time there's a new illegal settlement, 
uh, you're going to make it harder to get to peace because uh, for everyone who, who professes to want a two-state solution uh, that often you know, says we're going to go back to this 1967 maps with, with land swaps, if you have more illegal settlements, uh, one, um, you're displacing more uh, Palestinians, but two, uh, you're going to have a harder a, a time getting to that map that will actually work for everyone. So, you know, little things like that. But then when you also see the treatment, when you see a road with a giant wall down the middle, uh, for one side Israelis to drive on and the other side Palestinians, you know, none of those things are, I think, what we in the United States look at, especially right now as I think is, is heightened to Black Lives Matter movement is in this country. I think you look at these things and you see a lot of things that are happening that are not going to lead to that peaceful solution. So I, 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 and I'll tell you what I found, Ray, and this is something that I, I've said over and over and over again, the vast, vast, vast majority of people in both Palestine and Israel want peace. Uh, it seemed that Benjamin Netanyahu um, and perhaps Hamas uh, at times were the, the two entities that benefited from some of these conflicts, but it wasn't the average person that I talked to on the street that's looking for a, a peaceful solution. Yeah, and it, it's not easy, though, to convey that to members of Congress, what, 400-something members, um, and uh, it they were able to change your perspective by seeing what was actually happening. I was reading some of your tweets and a very progressive and very smart uh, Palestinians in Gaza live in an open air prison under air land and sea blockade with little access to water, food, electricity and health care. I don't think Americans understand that. And by the way, I'm a Christian Palestinian. My parents are from Bethlehem and Jerusalem. If you go to Bethlehem again, you got to go there and visit the Church of the Nativity. My cousin is the pastor there, so I'd want you to go there. And yeah. uh, because there's so many Americans that are tied to not just uh, the Muslim community, but the Christian community. And I think a lot of Americans don't realize that. What, was there something surprising to you when you went there that you didn't realize was happening that, you know, that might have opened your eyes a little bit when you got there? You know, I think when you go to a city like Hebron and you see the, the stark difference between the settler community uh, and, and then the rest of the community, which is the vast majority of the community, and, and that separation just stands out as something that just doesn't work. Uh, Gaza, as you brought up, Ray, I think is the best example. There hasn't been a member of Congress in the last decade that's been able to go to Gaza. And when you have an area with two million people where hundreds, are allowed in and out every year. By, by hundreds, that means, you know, basically the definition of an open-air prison, right, where you have 98% of the water that's undrinkable, where you have a majority of the people on food assistance with the UN, you have a fundamental problem. Um, and, and anywhere else, we would be having outcry like we do around Yemen and other countries that uh, have similar situations. And yet this is kind of a, a normal practice in the region, but it's anything but normal. And I think, you know, those are the things that you're right. Most people don't know about. They, they hear about bombs coming in from Gaza, and they hear about Israel uh, responding with bombs, but what they don't hear are maybe some of the other um, specificities that are going on on the ground that I think if people knew about, uh, and, and people are, I think, watching it closer again, like I said, because of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I think people are starting to see that when you treat people inhumanely, you're going to have bad outcomes. And it doesn't matter whether it's in the United States, uh, it's in Colombia, uh, it's in Yemen, or it's in uh, Palestine and Israel. Uh, we just have to use human rights as a real high measuring tool uh, that we expect human rights and dignity for everyone as an absolute minimum standard. And and you're uh, and I have to say though you're in a small group of the members of Congress who feel that way. There are a number of them that um, they've just opened their eyes, and it's not about criticizing Israel. It's about talking about human rights. We're talking about a government, right? And we want the government to do the right thing. We haven't. There's a new prime minister in Israel now. Uh, maybe that may happen, regardless of what his past was. Change sometimes. Uh, does bring good things, but how tough is it? I'm just curious. I mean, do you, do they get upset with you when you start saying some of these things? Have you been that? I don't know if the word threatened is 
politically threatened is correct, but has there been pressure on you to say, what are you doing? Why are you not towing the line? Yeah, you know, Ray, this is a sad statement, but bluntly, um, I am a white man, uh, and uh, white men don't get the same treatment, uh, the negative treatment that perhaps uh, women of color or especially Muslim women of color in our caucus do. So, you know, I haven't said that much different than members like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and others. But, you know, when people are looking for someone to attack, they always go to, unfortunately, the women of color. Um, and right. uh, you, know, you see a lot of that happen. Uh, what I, I think what makes it difficult is I do have a bit of a finesse position. Like, I support the Iron Dome because, to me, uh, the idea is de-escalation. If a missile does come, a rocket does come from Gaza, and you take it out in the air, no one's been injured, and there's no need for uh, additional retaliation. The problem is right now, but what we just saw uh, when there were missiles from Gaza, they used our support with the Iron Dome, but then they also sent 20 times the number of missiles and displaced 100,000 people and killed um, dozens of children uh, and hundreds of people. That isn't the intention of de-escalation. So when I call things out like that, I'm supportive of something that is a, a core part of the, the, the defense that they have, the United States gives, but I also expect it to be used in the, in the manner we intended, and if not, I, I do feel it's appropriate to call out uh, the misuse. I, I want to ask you about Afghanistan and this $50 billion, which I think, by the way, is a great idea. But um, before I do that, it is what do you think needs to happen? Because this conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has been going on 70 years. Um, it's a battle, more of a, it's as much a battle here in the United States as it is you know, over there and between the Israelis and Palestinians. What do we need to do to bring it to an end? There's got to be a middle ground solution that no one's going to be completely happy with, right? But, you know, we have to do something. We can't just let this continue like this. Do you see a solution? Do you see something that needs to be done? Do you think the administration, has, uh, so many have tried that maybe they can do something with it? What do you think? Well, there is a bit of a of pushing a restart button in Israel with a new government. And even though uh, it's a complex one with a, a coalition of very different political parties, and as you mentioned, a leader who has a, an interesting past that you might not think could work towards uh, as peaceful a solution, I, I'm still hoping uh, that there's some promise with that coalition. So that's good. There's a, there's a restart button hit at least in one spot. Um, I, I think we probably need to have that also on the Palestinian side, although uh, I don't quite know how that will happen. They just kind of recently called off elections, and I, I think that has to be figured out. But the thing that we can do is we can, as the United States government, take that neutral role that we used to have that tried to bring people to the table to negotiate peaceful solutions. And, you know, part of that, and the good news is I've talked to the U.S. State Department about this, you know, they have said to Israel no more unprovoked unilateral actions. In other words, uh, in those categories where the attack uh, on the, the uh, mosque uh, during um, you know, the, the holiday uh, were also, uh, they consider additional illegal settlement uh, would be fall in that category. That's a good thing, because if we can get back to that point that we are seen as an honest broker by everyone, uh, we can then use that influence of the United States to, to try to bring about peace. And, you know, that doesn't mean dictating solutions because it has to be decided in the region, but it does mean we can help bring people together, and I think that's the role the United States can best do. You know, I've been covering Chicago politics for years. I covered Chicago City Hall for 20 years between Daly and Daly, Jane Byrne, Harold Washington, and uh, it's so good to hear a refreshing voice, uh, your voice, uh, come out here from the Midwest. Uh, it's a good uh, thing to hear. Um, you had recently uh, signed a letter, led a letter uh, directing, urging, I guess, the administration to redirect $50 billion that has been spent every year on Afghanistan. Um, and we are getting out apparently completely, right? Because it's a 20th anniversary coming up um, and they want to be completely out of there. I'm not sure I'm things are going our way there but uh, tell us about that what you know how do we do that and is that something that we're going to be able to do to redirect that money toward benefiting the american people well i, I think uh, let me take it one step back ray is first of all i just think we spend too much on the pentagon period 
um, in the last four years under Donald Trump, at a time of relative peace, uh, we increased the defense budget 20%. Um, and wow. when you look at the amount of money we spend, and there's no audit, there's really no oversight over those dollars, like in every other federal agency, uh, there's obviously a lot of waste and fraud. We know that from uh, various things that have come out about their spending. In this case, with Afghanistan, if we really are bringing the troops home, which I'm supportive of, uh, there's going to be a saving. And rather than just letting it kind of sit in the piggy bank because they'll spend it down in order to get more money the next time, we should redirect that to other things that are really are, that are, are threats to the country. And, you know, recently Dr. Ja was on um, a, a committee I was uh, and and he was talking about COVID. He's one of the national experts on COVID. And he described it as a national security threat. And I completely agree. The biggest threat that this country has had in the last year and a half has been COVID-19, not another country. So why wouldn't we direct some of those funds to defending this country, but defending it on the healthcare front or on the climate change front? I think that that is a smarter use of our money, but in the true definition of the defense of the country. And I think there's a growing number of us in Congress who are saying that. And, uh, you know, we're hoping that there can be a, a dividend having some of that money put into something that could be used uh, in a different way, and in them hoping that that we'll be able to convince folks of that. And, and you're not saying let's hurt the defense budget. You're saying, hey, this is fifty billion. Now that we don't need to spend on something, let's redirect it properly instead of letting it just sit in the military pot. Correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think sometimes people need to understand the the size and scope, and it's hard because it's so large of the Pentagon budget. Just the increase that Joe Biden gave it, a 1.7% increase, relatively modest in, in historical terms for a defense budget increase, although you know, we had hoped it was going to be you know, flatlined and, and kept uh, at the same amount because we still think there's too much spending. But that little, that 1.7% increase is one and a half times the entire Center for Disease Control budget, their entire budget. So at a time that here we are coming out of COVID, we just went through hell and back, uh, you know, dealing with this, the amount of that we spend on things like that versus what we spend on, you know, missile systems and consultants and, you know, weaponry that often doesn't work uh, is staggering. And I think that's the point we're trying to make is we think we can right-size the spending, be even more effective in using it, and then have that, you know, some people might call a peace dividend, go towards things like health care and housing and, and climate change that would really benefit even more people. I think that's phenomenal. And uh, uh, listen, Congressman, we would love to have, I know that you're uh, tied up with time and you got so many important things to do, but we would love to bring you on in the future. If there are any other things that you're going to be doing, please reach out to us. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on the many different things. There's so many things from, Iran and all the issues and uh, the local thing, the coronavirus. Uh, and maybe just to ask you real quick, do you think we're out of that, uh, that uh, you know, coronavirus stranglehold that we've been in for the past year? Are we actually seeing daylight, do you think? I'm cautiously optimistic. It looks good. Things are reopening. I think there's great confidence in the scientific community on the vaccines but we still have some vaccine um, reluctance, and we do have to address that because if we can get to where the president's goal was, he was hoping to get 70% of adults to have the shot by July 4th. It looks like we're probably going to be a little closer to 67%. That's still strong, but we're going to continue to need people to get the shots, especially with new variants. Uh, the new Delta variant, for example, that came out of India right now is uh, very, uh, very much... Uh, it's more contagious. It's in the United States. And if people aren't vaccinated, they have a greater chance of still getting COVID. And, you know, the thing that I think people forget is, well, it was a lot of uh, older Americans and, and older people across the country that were dying in greater numbers. We also know there's no rhyme or reason. My 91-year-old mother caught COVID and had no symptoms whatsoever. And then I know really young and healthy people who got COVID and it nearly killed them. So, you know, it, we, we just have to continue to encourage people to get vaccinated if we can get those numbers just a little bit higher. And then we help the world as well in getting the vaccines out. Uh, I think we can beat this. But we're, we're definitely, we've, I feel like we've turned a corner and there's optimism out there. 
All right, Congressman Mark Pocan from the 2nd District, uh, Congressional District in Wisconsin. It's a real pleasure to have you on, and I hope we can have you back sometime talking about other issues, especially the, the Middle East, your progressive voice out there that really is needed, as you say. Um, you know, it's uh, your perspective, I think, is uh, so important, helping people understand the middle ground to see what's really needed uh, rather than listening to these voices on either extreme. I'm, I too many people are tired of it. It just really gets uh, exhausting. But thank you so much, Congressman. It's just a pleasure to talk to you this morning. Well, seeing here, Ray. Glad to be back on any time. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, you're welcome. You have a great day. Thanks so much. That was uh, Congress. That was Congressman Mark Pocan, who represents Wisconsin's second congressional district. He was elected in 2013. He served in the Wisconsin State Assembly. 14 years. We had him on by phone. Uh, we weren't able to get him on by Zoom, but hopefully in the future we will. And we do have a few more Congress people that we will be bringing on the show. Uh, Betty McCollum and uh, Marie Newman have both said they want to come on and talk. So we just have to work in their schedules. But uh, um, it's very informative to have that on. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break here and uh, at the Ray Hanania Show. Uh, on the U.S. Arab Radio Network, sponsored by Arab News at ArabNews.com. We're going to be talking about a really interesting topic right after the break, uh, something the Arab News has been working on. Uh, and our guest, uh, Jonathan Gornal, a British author and journalist, formerly with the Times of London. He's a feature writer for Arab News, based in the U.K. He's lived and worked in the Middle East for many years. He's been looking into the newly launched Arab News, G-E-R-D, deep dive, a deep dive look at the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. How will Egypt be impacted by Ethiopia filling its GERD reservoir? The primary purpose of the dam is electricity production to leave uh, to relieve Ethiopia's acute energy shortage. These are big issues over there, and we're going to talk with him and have him explain how you can get more information about that topic also at ArabNews.com. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bonham serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CD guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. Enjoy the first Syrian-style cuisine in Michigan. At Damas Cuisine and Catering, you'll find a wide selection of Syrian foods and sweets in our menu, like frike, poise, 
grape leaves with steak, mashawi platter, hot mahashi, char-grilled kebab, shawarma, and much more. Get super fast delivery from Damas Cuisine and Catering right to your door. Order online at damascuisine.com forward slash menu and track your order live. Damas Cuisine and Catering, 28841 Orchard Lake Road in Farmington Hills. Call 248-987-4985. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back to the Ray Hanania Radio Show here. It's Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. And um, our guest now is Arab News journalist Jonathan Gornal, a British author and journalist formerly with the Times of London, a feature and now a feature writer for Arab News. First of all, welcome to the newspaper, Jonathan. And welcome to the radio show. Go ahead, Jonathan. Can you hear me? No. Let's uh, get your. Uh, let's get Jonathan's. Uh, hi, hi, Ray. Oh, I'm there you go. <laughs> Great to be with you. Yeah, you know the technology is just crazy. I mean, you just have one button on a mic, but I got like fifty different things I got to do over here. It's like <laughs> Zoom. Impressive. Zoom is a Zoom is a four letter word. Okay, don't let anybody tell you anything else. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, t- welcome to the program. By the way, it's just a pleasure to meet you and have you on the show. Um, tell us about this uh, the GERD, which is the uh, um, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and what the Arab News is doing. Give us an overview of what's happening with that. Hmm. Well, uh, the, the dam has been controversial, especially in Egypt, uh, for the past decade. Um, Ethiopia announced they were going to build this enormous dam, creating this massive reservoir. Uh, they announced it, of course, uh, back at the height of all the troubles in Egypt. So. Egypt wasn't very focused on what was going on at the time, as you can imagine. Uh, now, of course, and ever since, there have been fears in Egypt that the creation of this dam on the Blue Nile, uh, which provides the majority of the water that gets into Egypt, is going to have a devastating effect on Egypt's economy, especially on its agriculture, of course. Um, nobody really knows what's going to happen because for the past 10 years, Egypt, Sudan, which is the country in between uh, Ethiopia and Egypt, and Ethiopia have failed to come to any agreement. There have been many, many attempts, many outside bodies from the World Bank to to the Arab states have have tried to mediate between these three countries. So far, everyone has failed. And now, this season, this summer, when the rains begin in the Ethiopian highlands, Ethiopia has said it's going ahead. It's going to fill the dam regardless of whether it has the approval or otherwise of Sudan or, or Egypt. And that, and what's interesting about that, and just to remind people that may not be familiar with it, when you're looking at the map, you see the Nile and Egypt in the north and Sudan underneath and then Ethiopia further south. There's a uh, thinking that the water flows downward, but that's not the case. It comes from Ethiopia and goes uh, from up in terms of the map. So there's a sense like, who cares about the Ethiopian dam? But the truth is, blocking it there, cr- creating a dam, is going to severely restrict the water that people in Sudan and Egypt have been relying on for years, wouldn't it? Could well, Or it, couldn't it? It, it could do. Um, our Arab news, we've produced um, what we call a deep dive, which is, as it implies, an in-depth look at this. Um, and in, in there, there is an interactive uh, simulation which allows readers to, to look at the effect on Egypt, um, depending on whether the dam is filled in two, three or six years. Now, it's the filling of this reservoir that's the important fact, because uh. once it's operating, it's a hydroelectric dam. 
by its very nature, it has to allow water to flow through. The problem comes with the filling. Now, Egypt has said if it's filled in anything under 12 years, it's going to cause huge problems for Egypt and its supply of water. Ethiopia, on the other hand, wants to get on with it. I mean, it's invested billions in this. Um, it wants to get on with it because it needs electricity. It's kind of tough to argue with Ethiopia's position. Um, right. Half of their people have no electricity in the 21st century. Um, this will kickstart uh, their industry. It will allow them to export electricity, cheap electricity, to the surrounding nations, including Sudan. Um, and what's more, uh, there's a very strong argument that this dam will regulate the flow of the Blue Nile, which until now has caused uh, cycles of flood and drought, especially in Sudan. Um, if it operates correctly, Sudan will be able to revolutionize its agricultural output. Now, the obvious, the advantages for Egypt are less obvious. And as I say, the crucial period is between now and whenever the dam is filled. And when I say now, I mean right now, because the rains are beginning to fall in Ethiopia and the highlands. Now we need to just watch and see how much water Ethiopia retains behind its dam, and crucially, how much it's letting out downstream to Sudan and Egypt. And, and I'm assuming it takes, uh, you're, it's going to take a while, right, to fill this reservoir enough so that it kind of creates this uh, large pocket of water that will then slowly go through the uh, the dam to create the electricity, correct? You, and correct, that's correct. part of the problem, right? Won't will the I mean, could the Nile go dry in the well, northern part? Well, I mean, as a result of something technically like this? the Nile would never go dry because it's also fed by the White Nile, uh, which meets the Blue Nile at Khartoum, um, but. I think about 80% of the water that gets into Egypt comes from Ethiopia, either through uh, the Blue Nile or one of its two tributaries. Um, it's, it's a serious problem. Um, it could be managed if all these countries were speaking to each other. But so right. far, they, they've been unable to come to any kind of agreement about the filling or the operation of this dam. Now is the time. That agreement has to be reached. One of, one of the interesting things about this is, is that a young uh, e Egyptian scientist working in, uh, in the U.S. has developed uh, an observation platform based on satellites um, where you, you can view on a day-to-day -day basis how much water is going to be retained and how much water is going to be let through. Um, the, the point of this, uh, this observation is to allow the states to negotiate transparently and to come up with some sort of plan transparently. Whether they're going to take it on or not, I don't know, but for sure all eyes in Egypt are going to be on, on this dam for the next uh, next year. Yeah, the question I was going to ask, obviously, is why, why don't Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia sit together and kind of work this out? I mean, it just seems like the three of them have, from Ethiopia, Ethiopia's standpoint, though, I can see, like, they need the electricity, and they have to do this, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. There isn't a very uh, another tributary that's that large that would produce the amount of electricity they need. But why don't they come together? Is it politics? Is it uh, pride and ego? You know, hey, that's the Nile. Nobody associates the Nile with Ethiopia. Right. Even Sudan, even though Sudan is the Nile goes through the Sudan, people associate the Nile with Egypt for it's just you grow up learning that is that yeah. what what are the issues preventing these three countries from trying to work something out I think uh, one of the main issues is psychological I mean I think it was Herodotus you know the, the ancient Greek historian sure. Egypt is the Nile um, right. the country grew up around the you know in the rich sediment that every year comes down the Nile flooded the Nile plain and the Delta Egypt is rooted psychologically and literally in the Nile. Um, since colonial times, it's had treaties, first with Britain and then between itself and Sudan, dividing up the share of the water of the Nile between, between the two countries. Now, Ethiopia says that those sort of colonial era 
treaties have no currency in the modern age. I mean, there are, what is it, 11 countries that share the Nile Basin. Only two of them are mentioned in these these treaties, which it's very difficult to see how you, you could enforce them in this day and age. Unfortunately, that's been Egypt's position. It wants its 55 billion cubic meters of water that it's it had agreed, you know, all those years ago. Um, and it doesn't seem like it's going to get it. What can Egypt do? It can take all kinds of steps in terms of regulating the way it uses water, how it how it grows its uh, its food stuff. You know, importing products that it currently grows might be a better way of approaching it in some cases. All kinds of measures it can take in terms of irrigation techniques and so on. But the bottom line is is that it has to come to an agreement because if it doesn't, it's essentially at the mercy of an upstream country that can turn the tap on or off, depending on geopolitical <laughs> factors. I, I was just going to say that it's uh, almost a national security concern for Sudan and Egypt because it is like contr- controlling a faucet. One country has control of at least this major part of the, as you point out, there are two big tributaries that uh, make up the Nile as it moves up uh, on the map. Um, but when one country can just turn that off, t- even temporarily, so they can build up what they need to do, that's going to have a huge impact. And I'm not sure that even managing, you know, water consumption is going to be enough to, you know, head off the kind of economic disaster that this could pose for Egypt. Could it? I mean, I, I know I read uh, in the Arab News this morning that uh, Sudan has gone to the United Nations. They asked the uh, Security Council to uh, meet and discuss this dispute, you know, to get involved. Have, have you heard if there's any likelihood that the Security Council is going to take this on seriously? I, I, I don't know. I mean, you'd hope so, but international organizations, including the UN, have been involved before in this dispute. Um, but, but you're right. Uh, it, it is a national security issue uh, for Egypt. And a few years ago, um, there was the embarrassing, embarrassing uh, moment when a group of Egyptian ministers were captured live uh, on TV. They didn't know they were miked, talking about possible military responses to this. Now, no one, we hear a lot about water wars in the future, but right here, right now is a scenario which if it isn't being managed carefully, and I think that that it means that outside agencies, including the UN and the Arab states, that of course have an interest in this area, um, people have to in- intervene to prevent this becoming the first great water war. Can you imagine the disaster? I mean, you could argue also that the moment when Egypt could have taken military action against this dam has passed. It already has a fair head of water in there. If this dam fails catastrophically, Sudan is going to be paying a very heavy price. So hopefully you'd think military response is off the table now, which means right. the only pay is, is, is diplomacy. And, and I assume that, you know, in building a dam, it does create this impending threat to any uh, villages, cities, uh, towns that are downstream. If something happens to the dam, it would be very destructive. So yeah. that. Yeah. And and my understanding is they built the dam, correct? That what are they? Has this been completed? This project? Yeah, yeah. all but completed. Um, you know, they're they're topping out sections, but it's it's a dam, um, and it can hold. Uh, when it's full, it's going to hold something something in the order of fifty fifty four billion cubic meters. Um, Lake Nasa holds more than that, seventy four billion, but the the the. The amount of water that the GERD is going to hold is equal to one and a half times the flow, annual flow of water into Egypt. So you, you can see the scale wow. of the potential problem for Egypt. I mean, if for whatever reason Ethiopia decided to just turn off the tap, they right. go to Egypt. I mean, Egyptian academics, let alone politicians, have been predict- predicting a complete disaster. You know, the, the, if, if this... this scenario evolved it would be a disaster but surely it can't be allowed to evolve because here are three countries that their neighbors they share an international river there has to be an international agreement 
on the use of that river. It's not fair to deprive Ethiopia of its benefits. It's not fair to deprive Egypt of its life-giving waters. We, it, has to be in a, it has to be an agreement. And it has to kind of be now because the dam is starting to fill. Yeah, and we've seen wars start over the closing of canals, correct? <laughs> In that region, so it they, they can't be brushed off. I mean, I I don't think the the do do people realize how serious the potential could be okay. that if this isn't addressed properly, that this could really turn into something completely unexpected. That people are going to say, "Wow, what happened over there? Why are we in this huge regional conflict now?" Yeah, um, it's one of the. It has that potential. Yeah, I mean, e- Egypt is all, already in, in um, to a degree, in water crisis. You know, the population's increasing. Um, the, the sediment is building up in the river. Um, we're, we're, we're losing agricultural land, in, in essence, which is vital for Egypt. Now, uh, Egyptian scientists, in, in league with uh, the government, they've come up with some scenarios about the cost to Egypt and this is purely related to the speed at which the dam is filled. If it were filled in six years, they estimate that something in the order of over three and a half million people would lose their jobs. Now, can you imagine the impact of that uh, on a society such as Egypt's? I mean, on top of that, they would have to increase imports by about 30% of agricultural foodstuffs. Now, that's if, if, if Ethiopia fills it over six years. Worst case scenario, two years, that three and a half million people losing their jobs goes up to over 10 million people. Now, wow. that would, that's a social disaster by anyone's uh, measure, right? So has to be avoided, has to be avoided. Yeah, and I would urge our listeners, if you get a chance, look this up. This is a fanat. This is one of the most elaborate productions I've seen. I mean, the Arab News does some phenomenal deep dives, and they really get into a lot of topics. But this one is very cool. You can scroll down. You can see the, the layout on online of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. As you go further, there are some voices from uh, different people who are video voices that explain you know, wh- what's happening, why it's so important. What I I don't know if there's something you want to showcase about this uh, uh, deep dive uh, presentation that the Arab News has put together. I mean, it's just very exhaustive and informative. Yeah, yeah. We, as you say, we Arab News um, does deep dives and does them very well, if I may say so. Um, yes, they do. A lot of time, a lot of energy and expertise is put into these because they they stand as almost academic works, you know, reference works. Now, this one is, is far from being an exception. And many, many, many published papers were examined and reviewed. Uh, the information that's gone into this is exhaustive. Um, I think readers will, will, will engage with it because, uh, as ever, there's a lot of interactivity in there and um, you can work your way through their various permutations, the various scenarios, and see for yourself what the cost will be. Also, within the deep dive, um, there's this unique um, window on events, which is being provided by, uh, it's, a, it's a tool actually called Nibras, which has been uh, developed, as I say, by this Egyptian academic working uh, in the US. It, sta- it stands for, it stands for um, uh, the, the whole, the whole point, point of this, as I said, is to try to get people to to come together and just deal with the facts. But those facts are there for our readers to see now. You can click on, I mean, I'm, I'm clicking on now, um, right. June, the, June the, uh, the 20th. I can see exactly what the inflow was on that day to wow. um, the GERD, to this dam. Now, I can see that it's beginning to rise. In other words, the floods that are expected in the Ethiopian highlands have started. So I can see that. If I go back in a week or two, that level will have risen, the impounding level. In other words, the amount of water within the dam will have risen. Readers can look at that. At the same time, they can go and look at the uh, the, uh, the Aswan High Dam, and they can see how much water is um, making its way into Lake Nasa and how, mu- how much water is left in Lake Nasa. So there's going to be a lot of talk over the next months, 
possibly years about the crisis that's evolving. I think before people panic, before they uh, jump to conclusions or are led, uh, they need to go and look for themselves. You can see for yourself, well, hey, actually, we still have quite a lot of water in high as one dam. We're okay. <laughs> uh, or alternatively, they can see for themselves if indeed disaster is looming. So, yeah, a lot of work has gone into this deep dive. And um, Yeah, and, I, and I've been... I've yeah, been well, reading I, through I, it. I, I, just wanted to say, I just wanted to say, yes. Ray, that I, I hope it serves um, as an instrument that will be useful to both sides in coming together and looking at the facts rather than, you know, reacting to the emotive kind of uh, the speeches we get about all this. Everyone in this, in this particular dispute has a point to make. Um, but the main point is, is that this river is an international river and many, many countries rely on it. They need to all get together, and they need to work this out, and, and soon. Yeah, now, I, w I was going to say that I have been going through this uh, project that you, as a writer, put together and researcher uh, with a number of people. Leanne Fouad uh, was also re did research with the editor, Tarek Ali Ahmed, you know, uh, helped put this together with S uh, Simon Khalil, uh, oh, I, just the whole list of all the people under uh, our e I C uh, Faisal Abbas. I mean, he's really come up with some really innovative things. This is like a book, but it's so detailed and it's easy to navigate to find things. I don't think I've ever seen anything this uh, advanced and easy to understand as this display that the Arab News has put. And I know people are saying, well, why are we talking about the Nile and Ethiopia and Sudan and Egypt? There's nothing going on. But I think that something serious could be going on if this thing continues to fester. I mean, that's the big concern, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just to go back to the uh, the presentation of this deep dive, you're right. Um, our graphics, our graphics team under under Simon Collier, always phenomenal, always, and they've they've really excelled themselves. I think with this, it's all about communicating hard facts in a very digestible way, and and I, I think Arab News with these deep dives really gets that balance right. And I think there's even a poll on here someplace where they ask you, uh, you decide if. Uh, um, you know, what the impact is going to be. It, uh, Egypt fears that the faster the dam is filled, the more it'll suffer. So how quickly should Ethiopia fill the dam? It could take a short period and cause devastating impact or a long period and uh, maybe uh, alleviate some of the concerns. I mean, is that really the issue? How fast they do it, you think? Yeah, I mean, it is exactly the issue right now. I mean, and it's an issue which can hang over Egypt for, well, possibly the next decade. Um, how fast you fill a dam like this is going to depend very much on uh, the climate, you know, how much rainfall there's going to be. I mean, don't forget, we, we, we've had some very serious drought years in this region. We'll get them again. It's a cycle. Um, if Ethiopia fills this dam as quickly as it can during a drought cycle, then the impact on Egypt and Sudan will be devastating because Ethiopia will be taking more of the water that's available. Um, so those are the kind of things that they need to work out. How will they operate the dam during cycles of drought? Um, the other, I mean, it has to be said that there are upsides to this dam. I mean, as I said earlier, it right. will regulate the Nile flow. So in a normal year or in a flood year, instead of all the farms and houses and people being swept away along the banks of the Blue Nile in Sudan, um, there would just be a, a steady, steady flow that enables farming to take place on a proper annual cycle. Um, so there are upsides if it's operated correctly. But at the moment... Neither Sudan nor Egypt has any assurance or any guarantee that it will be operated to the benefit of all rather than just right. the benefit of Egypt. Or that they'll or that they'll have a voice in it. Yeah. But that's a, yeah, that's what they're doing right. right now. And and when you don't have a voice, what do you do? You start shouting louder and, and and you may take action which you later regret. 
they should publish this in a book. I think I'm going to suggest to the Arab News that they turn this into a book because it is fascinating. My guest on the line, Jonathan Gornell. Uh, Jonathan is a uh, writer, features writer for Arab News based in the UK. Jonathan, it's a pleasure. The first time being on the radio show here. Uh, just a pleasure to have you on here and going through this phenomenal uh, project that Arab News uh, put together with your help and the help of Ali, uh, Tarek Ali Ahmed and others. Uh, Simon Khalil, uh, just fascinating. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us this morning. Complete pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. All right, buddy. We will talk again. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take our final and last break here at the Ray Hanania Show. And when we come back, a few little announcements, and then uh, we'll close it down. So we'll, we'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Kashat's Mediterranean Market in Shish Kebab offers a great array of your favorite Mediterranean meals. Meals range from lamb specialties, shawarma sandwiches, and seafood dinners. Plus, they offer big trays of your favorite food and so much more. Kashat's Mediterranean Market in Shish Kebab is located at 32839 Northwestern Highway in Farmington Hills and is open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So stop in or call Kashat's today at 248-538-9552. That number again 248-538-9552 Kashat's Mediterranean Market and Shish Kebab will definitely leave you satisfied when it comes to reproductive medicine, IVF Michigan Fertility Centers are the recognized leaders. With locations in Bloomfield Hills and five other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. As a founding member of IVF Michigan Fertility Centers, Dr. Nicholas Shama is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. Dr. Shama has performed over 10,000 IVF cases and has helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. American board certified in both obstetrics obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility, Dr. Nicholas Shama is a very caring, compassionate, expert physician that understands not only the medical but also the emotional toil of infertility on his patients. When it's time, get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio. Call toll-free 855-952-9600, 855-952-9600. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back, guys. We close the show. I want to thank you all for listening. And uh, go check out that uh, deep dive into the uh, uh, the uh, Eth the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The website is ArabNews.com. The direct link is Battle for the Nile, ArabNews.com slash Battle for the Nile. I'm Ray Hannity. I'll see you again next Wednesday morning here at 8 a.m. Eastern Time on WNZK AM 690 and WDMV AM 700. We'll talk to you later. Remember, check out ArabNews.com. You have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.